and um, by my grandma's side. And uh, her dad owns a motorcycle. You know, I like to ride bikes. Mm -hmm. So I went over there and uh, he said, man, take the bike and go anywhere you want to go. So she's sharp. She's really sharp, you know. So she sits on the back with me, her hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> so I goes by your, goes by grass, and I was like, mm -hmm. and I pulls up on the, on the bike and get off, you know. And she's got these boots on, you know, and she's stacked, boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Grant said, come on, Grant said, uh, come on in. No, 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 yeah, yeah. He said, come on in. So I went on in, and they were sitting at the table eating. You were there. I think you were there. Anyway, uh, his wife was sitting there eating. Mm -hmm. As soon as this girl walked in, and she saw that, that girl look. <laughs> <laughs> was always present was the famous upstroke. Yeah. He loved the Charlie Christian concept mm -hmm. of uh, the guitar being just as important as a horn. Yeah. And so he thought of himself as a Charlie Parker, so to speak, right, you know. Right. And to me, he was. Yeah. Yeah. The clarity of his guitar yeah was really due to the way he picked with his right hand. It was really incredible because he, he really dug in and picked out the exact note he wanted, touched nothing else, it was super clean. And there was a lick that Grant played. <clears throat> and I, I thought he was having trouble with it, you know? Mm -hmm. Of course, he phrased it so beautiful. I mean, you didn't really miss it, but as a guitar player, mm -hmm. I felt that he was having problems with the line. And it was very simple. It went, <laughs> And I said, well, let me see what the problem is. So I picked up my guitar and I tried to play it. And I found that I couldn't. I said, well, why does this look so strange? Yeah. And so one of my friends came over the house, and he's a great guitar player. He used to play with Harry Connick Jr. And uh, I said, man, listen to this record. And he listened to it. He loved the album, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, the album Easy with Grant Green. Uh, the last album he played, right. and he said, uh, "He said, what's so hard about that lick you you were talking about?" I said, "Try it." And so he picked up my guitar and he lit it because he had great technique, you know. Yeah. And he started playing, and he just stopped about the same place I did, <laughs> you know. <laughs> he phrased so beautifully; mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he would leave out two or three notes, and you would not because you could feel the rest of the notes. Yeah. Well, that's the difference between just playing the guitar and, and really making it sing, you know. Mm -hmm. I think Grant's phrasing, his approach to phrasing was so unorthodox and so different that it made him attractive, not only to guitar players, but the simplicity of his phrasing appealed to everybody. Yeah, sometimes you mention about people like in the audience, old men, where they were like shouting out things to my dad. What oh yeah, it was, like? it was always intense. Uh, you know, you could just, you know, tell the story. Tell the what? The story. Tell the story. You know, Grant was a storyteller. He would start from the bottom and work his way all the way up. So by the time you got to the to the end of the tune, it was people were standing up shouting. Mm -hmm. It was a hot place. Yeah. You know, every club you played, it was like that. Uh, I remember Grant coming to Ann Arbor, the Golden Falcon, and it was on a school night. We um, I went to U of M and we uh, went to the club to hear Grant. Yeah. Great crowd there and. Uh, college students, you know, mm -hmm. and most of the kids had never heard anything like that before. The sound was, again, like I say, it was, was wiped was, us out. Was a band like, did they have a tight sounding band? Oh yeah, it was a very tight band. Yeah. Vibraphones, which, which was a rare instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, he had the vibes. He had a cat named Mabutu on percussions, and this mm -hmm. cat wore the long robe and a big Kong cymbal, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was real deep. I've heard him swing play ballad, but you could tell there was some thought about the line, what he was doing, you know what I mean? His cats like set up a rhythm, and when it comes time to do his ad lib scene, you could feel and hear the thought before, you know, right. what's going on. It's not just a bunch of strumming and picking he did. Right. You can like sense when a cat is just going through the motion but you can feel when a man delivers a note and you get a little ting from it, it lifts you. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to my, uh, my grandfather's house, which is my dad's father, and 
I guess I had to be at least about six or seven or maybe a little younger. There was an album called The Latin Bit. And the album cover was pretty cool. And that really caught my attention because my dad was sitting down with this, uh, like this big hat on Mexican hat. I think it's called a, a sombrero. And he had this thing thrown over his shirt, like this Mexican outfit. And he, and he was holding his guitar. And I used to play this album almost every day I went there for hours and hours and hours and listened to him play. And that was like the first, that was my first taste of jazz, I believe. <laughs> I, I would, I would, you know, I would really love to see, uh, you know, like how you would open a show because I've seen you dance before. And okay. It's so beautiful. I mean, I mean, Thank I, you. I, mean I could, I could imagine how things were back in the old days. Oh, don't I mean, say shows old were really, days. No, but I'm just saying shows are really, they're really good I shows. I love it. I love it. When I hit that stage, that's another world. Mm -hmm. That's the world that people are out there, and I feel like the world belongs to me. And some people say, well, at your age, you should be in a rock and roll. Rock for what? And I can make people happy. I can make people laugh. My grandchildren, you know, they love me for whom I am. And I walk, I don't know anything about age. When I'm here, I, I don't like to read books or watch too much TV unless the, the basketball game is on and I'm watching the game. And basically, I just, you know, cut the lights down low, light a candle, and just, just get lost in music. I'm more of the 60s kind of thing. I really like when the 60 guys, they were getting to the the, real, the funk era, the end of the period, like uh, guys like Lee Morgan and, and Lou Donaldson. You know, when those guys are getting to that kind of funk era, I, I really like that a lot, you know. And, you know, I, I, I like, I love Pat Metheny. I think he's awesome, you know. I love Roy, Roy Hargrove. Oh, I love him. I love, I love his music. It's, it's real light and bouncy, you know. It's kind of like lofty, you know. I don't know. He's cool. He's a cool guy. You play your daddy's music? Yeah, I play his music too. I mean, um, I play everything he has, you know. Uh, I think this is, I think I'm the most educated in this music that I would be, ever be in my life right now. And it's, it seems like every time I go to the record store, there's something new out on him and I have to buy it because I have to understand. To me, it's like, a, it's like the cycle and I'm understanding his music. When I, when I first met you, I interviewed you, I didn't know the name Grant Green had any real significance beyond you know, the notebook, right. <laughs> that name in my notebook. And you never really told me who your father was. It wasn't until I, I went to your mom's house and I saw the CD on the floor that I knew that there was another Grant Green other than the guy I was dating. Um, and you told me more about your dad shortly after I saw that CD. It took a while before you finally started telling people that that's who your dad was. Your dad was a famous jazz guitarist. Uh, why is it different now? You do it more often now, don't you think? Well, I think, you know, living in Florida, Florida never had much of a jazz audience, so to speak. I mean, you know, you go in record stores and you see, you see more people like Kenny G and Dave Cars and stuff like that. But when you come, when you're like now I'm living in, in Michigan and Detroit, or when I was living in New York and places like that, you know, there is a large jazz audience there. And, you know, and, you know names like Grant Green and people that they haven't heard in Florida are, are very popular. So, you know, basically that, that was it because I could ask someone in Florida and Miami, you know, have you heard of Grant Green? And it could be like in their 40s, they like, I haven't heard of him. But you can ask someone like in, uh, in like, you know, here up, up, in, up in Detroit, if you heard of Grant Green in their 40s or in their 30s, they say, oh, hell yeah, you know, he's a he's jazz guitarist, blah, blah, blah. When our teacher, Mrs. Stokes, who was not only our homeroom teacher, she was also the music teacher for the school. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she'd have business in the office with our principal and the other teachers that might would take an hour. And we'd get on the piano and have jam session, you know, and he'd have the drumsticks beating them on the <laughs> desk and I'd be boogie wooging on the piano and anybody <laughs> else would want to get up and do their thing, they just got up and did it. And then all of a sudden, you know, she'd peep her head in the door and I'd jump in my seat and he'd jump in his seat and everything get quiet. We'd sitting there looking all innocent. We got spankings in those days, you know, the teachers and the principals, they could, they could well you now.
the only hospital that African American people could go to then. And the club was in a white neighborhood and they, with the woolly white strip joints. <laughs> I actually hired a man out of a, a, a part of a lot of a uh, white strip joint. And it was a very racist thing. And I had a motorcycle like a Nazi, looked like a Nazi motorcycle with a sidecar. Mm -hmm. And I would ride that up and down the street with Grant sitting in the driver's seat. <laughs> and there was a professional wrestler. He owned this one big joint and I pulled right up and he was at the bar. And I turned around and grabbed Grant's head and gave him a big kiss right on the lips. <laughs> and this professional wrestler come running out of the joint after us. I'm taking off down the street. And he took the parking meter and just ripped it out of the concrete, <laughs> chasing us down the street <laughs> with his parking God. meter. So there were some real turbulent days. It was very, very bad. You know, I'm, I'm basically a businessman. I said, <laughs> listen, now, you got to put a door charge on here. Right to keep the crowd down. He, I think he started charging 50 cents to get mm -hmm. in. Right. It was still packed. Now that was kind of like big right money down. too. And it was, I mean, 50 oh. cents, that wasn't, that wasn't like uh, peanuts, was it? No, that was, that was good money. That yeah. was good money. Well, that was the beatnik days. Right. So there were a lot of chicks dressed in black and people sitting around playing chess, professors reading poetry and the right. band cooking behind them. Very nice. I was fortunate enough, I was very young and I was, I was about, I was about, 19, 19 when I was playing with my grand. I was 17 when I was with Alvin. All these gentlemen were much older than I was, but, but they raised me. Most of the guys out there, yeah, I'm the youngest uh, one here. Okay, then. They raised me, everybody. I love every one of them. I, you know, I was just uh, out of high school, and I just go around and hang around and listen to all, the, all these gentlemen, most, most of them. But mm -hmm. I got with Leo's Five, mm -hmm. and uh, we were backing name entertainers at this club called the Blue Note Club. Right. He would bring in Sonny, Stitt, Grant Green, Tab Smith, and all of them. And we were back. Well, I, well, everybody in the band was older than I was. And whenever we played behind Grant, you know, Grant was, Grant was a zany, happy man. You know, my memories of him, you know, most of those little guys just treated me like I was his son. But then again, he would bullshit me a lot. You know, right, man, right. he's like, you know, I thought I was, you know, I was really doing it all. I said, Grant would always say, eh, motherfucker, you can't play. <laughs> you know? yeah, and that kind of broke my heart, man. He always looked around at the keyboard guy as if he was playing the wrong note. So, and uh, he would, he would, some expression would come over his face like, why are you playing that note? You know, and he looked around at him and looked like the keyboard man knows, so he straightened it out. You know, here I, those those guys were my idol. But you know, but, deep, deep down inside, though, if you really couldn't play, you wouldn't be. I wouldn't be with them, right? Exactly. Right, because right. right. little and little man used to always tell me, you, I, I I I stayed with the band, and then from then went on from now. I played by some of the biggest names in the mm -hmm. business, you know. And I knew that unless I was at least swinging, mm -hmm. you know, you can have the licks would come. Yeah. But the basic thing, you wouldn't be on the stage with those guys if you wasn't swinging. There you go. And little man would always stay beside me, you know. You gotta switch. You gotta mm -hmm. switch. Make that shit switch, you know. If you were doing it, mm -hmm. he, he, I mean, the, the average musician would come up and say, hey, man, like, uh, you stunk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's really a left-handed compliment because uh, uh, they are apprehensive about saying, hey, man, you sure are doing it. Right, right. You know, and, that, and so, uh, in other words, keep working with it and uh, you'll get better. Exactly. But uh, you say, hey, man, you've arrived. He's subject not, he's subject to relax. Right. And right. so you tell him, hey, man, you stink. He was so much more and vanguard, mm -hmm. uh, you know, musically. Right, right. You know, the stuff that I had been trying to play, he was already playing and gone beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I kind of felt intimidated at first when I first started working with him. But, right. then, but then we jailed. Right, right. And right. he liked me and mm -hmm. I liked him and we started complimenting. I started complimenting him and he would compliment me, mm -hmm. which was something that I didn't get out of the ordinary guitarist. Yeah. What I recall most about Grant, other than his music, of course, was that he and I uh, used to frequently go out behind the club during intermission and, and get high. Mm -hmm. And uh, Grant was a lot of fun and always joking and laughing. And I was not surprised someone had brought up drugs. I was more surprised that it was the only mention. Perhaps most knew that we all have our demons. You know, he was like a, a kid. Uh, he was a friend to most of them. Unless you had knew him, yeah, uh, you couldn't get close to him. I came to New York um, with Jack McDuff. I was 19 years old, and uh, 
Someone said that Grant Green was playing uptown on 42nd Street, Broadway. I said, wow, I was gone. Because I had heard his records uh, a couple of years earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started going to jam sessions, I was 17 years old. And the guy who was conducting the, and they weren't really jam sessions, they were get-togethers. Guitar players used to get together on Saturday and we drink this little cheap wine and we talk about, you know, we play guitar records. He said, man, there's a new cat, man. His name is Grant Green. Check him out. We put his records on. I said, wow, that's a really different style, man. I, I mean, never heard anybody play like that. Yeah. And West Montgomery was new then. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were playing Jimmy Smith records with Kenny Burrell. So when I got to New York with West Mon I mean, with uh, Jack McDuff, uh, and he mentioned that Grant Green was playing up the street, I took off. Yeah. And when I got there, uh, maybe in this uh, club, uh, he had to go down the stairs, and in the back they had a little bandstand. Right. Uh, the club only held about maybe 75, 65 people. And Grant was playing, they had a nice organ player with him, and drummer it was just a trio. And their music was just phenomenal. It was just incredible. It was, it was an unforgettable sound. And uh, and I never forgot that. That was that was my introduction. They made me play that night because Grant had heard about me. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Lou Donaldson sat in that night, and Lou Donaldson said, "Hey, I heard about you, man. You you the new guitar player with Jack McDuff. They say you're only 19 years old, and say you can play." Oh my God. And I said, "Oh man, I can't sit in with Grant Green, you know." But they did make me play a song, you know, and that was well received. But I wasn't there yet. Right. I'm, I'm real terrified because I've seen your name on a lot of Blue Note albums. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, welcome to the studio. Nice you. to have you here, Grant. And uh, I, I, I just want to tell you, it was really, I had wonderful times with your father. He was a wonderful person and we made some great records. And uh, it was, you, you know, very straightforward, very, very, very mellow. He'd be very relaxed and just absolutely yeah. no problem to record. So it isn't as if I had to work too hard on these things right. as far as Grant. When Grant was there, I knew that we'd get a good guitar sound. Actually began, the first full year was in 1960. And it was really the place that I went after I left my parents' home where I had been doing recording up to that time. You were particularly committed to independent labels. Well, they're the ones who would call me and ask me to record. Uh, uh, I always felt, uh, it, it, I don't know if commitment is the right word, those were the people yeah. who would call me and ask me to work for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always felt that I had an obligation to them to uh, l put them in a position where they could compete with the big major companies on a sound level uh, and on a, on a quality level in particular. And uh, uh, because uh, I felt that up to that time they were, they were beholden to those big companies. They had to go there to press their records. I got you. Uh, they had to go there to have their records made. They had to go to the studios that were owned by the big companies. I'll show you this, Grant, because uh, someone someone just lent me this album. It's, it's uh, back in 1965. Wow. We recorded it here, and your father's on here. And I'm just wondering if you had ever seen it. It's with Johnny Hodges and uh, Wild Bill Davidson. I've and, never uh, seen I'm it. just wondering. If, and I I don't even remember that. I have never seen this before. I think one of the great talents that Grant Green had was that. He liked to play with different kinds of musicians. Everyone didn't have to be like himself. Right. And so he was always assembling a, a variety of artists uh, to join him in, the, in the, his recording. I had a new son. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a uh, staunch Muslim. Right. You know, your dad was a Muslim. Exactly. We, so we had a very good rapport. That we were both uh, religious, uh, you know. You, you kind of get a little horny. Mm -hmm. And, and, but if you stay, keep your prayers up, you, you, you stay strong. Right, right. They say. That's what they say, right? <laughs> okay. My mom and my dad got divorced in the, in the 70s. So I, went, I went to Jamaica, so the early part of my life, I never knew him because he was always in the studio on the road. I, you know, talked to him about, you know, his life in the 60s and what it was like being in St. Louis and, you know, leaving his hometown, venturing to hot, crazy, hectic New York, you know, to be a young jazz, you know, guitarist, you know. And of course, I would bring out my little guitar and say, please, I need some lessons real bad because I don't know what I'm doing, you know. And, you know, just, you know, just, I don't know, just talk about anything, anything that's, first thing, you know, anything that comes to my mind, I would just ask him, talk to him about it, you know. Probably be proud of you and 
I don't know. I suck, but what the hell, you know? It's still beautiful, you know? <laughs>